When you Google image search wanted criminals, the one thing that sticks out to me is just how utterly unassuming most of the faces staring back at you really are. Of course, there's the odd mugshot that screams, I'm not a great person. But for the most part, these faces are ones that you would pass in the street and not even give them a second glance. That sentiment could definitely be said about David McMillan. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. There he is. Oh, there you are. Well, <laughs> that's all right. We got uh, there. Listen, uh, are you still getting your shit together? Or um, I'm, I know I'm good. I'm, I'm. We can, we can get going. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to. I, I, I realized how late it was over there. Well, all right. Um, let me just get a, a drink, and I'll yeah. get back in a flash. Perfect. Uh, at almost 70 years old, David has lived a life that is almost unbelievable. The head of an international drug trafficking business that spanned across multiple continents. A decade behind bars in Australia. Relentlessly pursued by the US Drug Enforcement Agency. Wanted by Interpol. Not to mention two death penalty sentences. And the only Westerner on record to have successfully escaped Bangkok's Long Prem Prison also referred to as the Bangkok Hilton. Would they have executed me? I think they, Australia definitely gave the go-ahead. Mm. Britain didn't care. Uh, the Americans were quite keen on it. They, they liked a, <laughs> a foreigner being executed as long as it wasn't an American. My name's Jack Lawrence. Welcome to Wanted. Or as David likes to put it, Earnestly desired, I like to think of it. <laughs> <laughs> Fondly remembered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a wanderer of the soul Before the end I plan to be whole But I know I'll lose myself along the way What's gone is gone What's past is past Let me leave what belongs in the past It's April 5th, 1956, in the West End of London. John and Rosie McMillan welcome into the world their new baby boy, who they name David. David's mother Rosie was in fact Australian, and as a result, David would make several trips back and forth between the two countries as a youngster. We've actually got something in common because I was also born in the UK and emigrated to Australia. You came over with your, your mother, I believe. I, I did. I came over on the Orsovo when I was three. Well, the first time. We went back uh, when I was seven and then ten. So I sort of imported myself a few times. In fact, I'm, I'm Australian by... I misread the certificate. I thought it said uh, citizenship by being decent. It wasn't. <laughs> it was descent. It's just that <laughs> mum and dad were actually born in Australia. I thought... Oh, well, that's pretty damn. I mean, if that's not forgiveness, what is? <laughs> so, your, so your parents were actually born in Australia? Rosie, my mother, was. And um, as much as he tried to hide it, uh, my father, John McMillan, uh, was uh, Australian. I mean, he changed his accent several times. But I heard just a bit of Australian in there. During the war, he, he was a, a major or something in the... Um, radio section where they did try to counter the German propaganda. So I don't know what side he was on. <laughs> he was pretty good. <laughs> As for David's father, he says he really didn't have much of a relationship with him. He got himself um, a CB, which is commander of the British Empire. So he, he, he was a real snob and didn't think much of me. And not because he probably had any fundamental objection, and it just didn't fit into, um, he kind of scripted his life and there, there wasn't really a, a role for me in, in that. <laughs> David's mother and father would separate when he was still very young and he would again head back to Australia with his mother and sister and move to Melbourne. He would attend Caulfield Grammar Private School in Melbourne's southeast until he was asked to find another school after what he says was an incident with his chemistry teacher who claimed that David had attempted to make a batch of LSD. Some possible early warning signs of what was to come in David's life. 
It was the 1970s in Australia, and drug use was not particularly underground. And so-called hard drugs were not really distinguished between anything else. David says even from a young age, he knew that he was going to need control in life. And to get control, he would need money. And in fact, the law was something that was just there to be broken, as he witnessed firsthand so-called respected people doing just that. One of the worst influences my um, mother, one of, I say one of my stepfathers, there wasn't quite that many, but one, Jim Troop was uh, a respected gynaecologist who, with some other Melbourne doctors, were challenging the anti-abortion laws. And they'd been paying off the cops because they were the only properly qualified doctors doing the, running the surgeries. But, and it was the vice squad of all, all departments that were in charge of uh, taking an interest in that sort of thing. Uh, so all the surgeries were in cash. And when it became public, when the doctors got arrested and they were taking them to court and police were feeling threatened and threatening us in our household. So you can imagine this. My mother said it was the worst possible influence where we were surrounded by respected people who came home with a soup or a bag full of cash. Uh, the police were the enemy. The laws were there to be broken. Uh, and I was 14 years old. So how would David go about taking control? How was he going to make his money? Well, he would find that answer in the local library. By 18, I was really going to the library looking up what is the quickest and most profitable thing to do in the world. And uh, the Guinness Book of Record made it very plain that the wholesale price of opium in the fields of Turkey compared with the street price in New York City, the final product, was 127,000%. Dear God. Hmm. I thought, okay, <laughs> I think they've left out a bit in this story. But... <laughs> and by chance, I ended up meeting uh, some safe crackers who'd retired and wanted to put their money into something. They used to buy marijuana from the uh, Murray River Valley Italians there, but Really, what they wanted was somebody who could import, and I thought I could do that. This just seemed to be my kind of thing. David formed a friendship with this group of former safe crackers, guys that were all loyal to each other, always looking out for one another, and he felt drawn to their world. They had a need, and David decided he could fill it. So he leaves his job at the city cinema and decided that he was going to have a crack at importing the drugs that these retired safecrackers were after. One of them gives him a loan for a few thousand dollars and David sets off for India on the hunt for some hashish. His initial plan was to import a big piece of machinery which had weights in it. Then they would be removed and replaced with the drugs and thus weighing the same on its return. Good plan on the outset, but David soon found out that he would have to pay an extraordinary amount in duty just to get it into the country. So that was off the table. It would be a chance meeting, however, with a man at the money exchange, which would see him pull off one of the worst attempts at a drug importation you can think of, as he's given six kilos of hash and then sets about trying to hide it in an old 1950s radio, jumping back on a plane and heading straight to Sydney. My first little importation of six kilos of hash from India was pretty hopeless. But um, I all stuffed into a, a 1950s Grundig radio that had been eviscerated completely. A kind of avuncular customs officer at Sydney opened my suitcase. There's nothing in it. I think there were three pairs of socks, a T-shirt and this thing. <laughs> and you just, just come back from India? <laughs> yeah, yeah, straight from uh, New Delhi. Whack, into Sydney Airport. Uh, he looked at it and spun the tuning dial, which kept on spinning, gravity doing its stuff. Nothing behind there to stop it from spinning. <laughs> oh, and he said, are you um, going back there? No, no, I said. 
I'm going to see that you don't and take the fucking radio with you. Um, uh, you'd, you'd never get that kind of break these days. No, absolutely They work in not. teams. Talk about close call. But this didn't deter David from his ambitions of drug importation. No, he just needed to get better at it. Soon enough, I'm doing pretty well. Instead of um, accosting and, and living on the good graces of uh, some wizened Sydney uh, customs officer, I, I, I've learnt how they do their thing, that when you arrive back in the country, um, they want to know where you've come from. They want to look at your passport and see the history of it. Mm. So I need passports, a lot of them. I also noticed they worked in teams, and uh, if you did get stopped, which shouldn't happen if you've got it all together, but let's just say you do, you would be in front of two officers. The first one would do the searching of your bag. He'd drop the lid onto his hand uh, just to feel the weight of it. Then he'd lift up pretty much every object, uh, the toiletries bag, unzip it, give it a jiggle, zip it up, put it aside, unrolled towel, lift up something else. Could he search everything? No. Did he have any uh, special information? Likely as not. But you'd come from an iffy place and you're a young guy, so, you know. But this is what happens. The guy watching from behind with whom you're having some kind of stilted conversation because you're shitting yourself that <laughs> this thing will be found. When the guy who's going through your stuff lifts up teddy bear, hmm, gives him a bit of a squeeze, a heft, and puts him aside in the cleared objects. You, if you don't know what I did by then, huh, the shoulders drop down. You look up at that officer that you've been talking to. Oh, yes, suddenly you're a new man. Yeah, well, I, I didn't really like Bali and, you know, well, the girls in Bangkok. It's like talking to a different person. As soon as you change like that, he taps the man who's doing the searches. The last object was it. Wow. And that was the part I liked, the research. And, and, and people didn't have the passion for it. I, in recruiting, her, I said to some people, I don't want lazy criminals. You've got to... You don't run away from it. I mean, people say, oh, if there's something, if there's going to be a problem with this stuff, I'm dropping it and running. You've got to be impassioned about it. And it got to the point, really, where I didn't want to let the stuff go, especially if it was like Coke from Colombia. I'd sort of care over it, packing it and using laminate so that no odor would ever escape from it. When I finally get back to my little zone of operations and unpack this thing fairly carefully because the, I could use the devices a few times. And then I put it there in front of me. Jack, I didn't want to let him go. Well, it was a her by then who'd taken on a kind of ship's feminine personality. David was so involved and obsessed by the process of smuggling drugs that even when he got to the stage of having couriers and putting them through training, he was always close by. It was like some school teacher in their final exam when they were going through. I couldn't leave them alone. I'd be in a couple of seats up from on the plane. And, so you would uh, you would go with really... like trainee, as it were, couriers to make sure that they were okay. Yeah. Oh, and, and particularly when they're on a real job, I didn't, I didn't want them making any decisions. That would be a disaster. And even if they were asking what it was they were smuggling, I'd say, well, I uh, think of the worst thing you can imagine. Uh, plutonium. Uh, you know, just anything that would take it out of their mind. You, uh, you don't want to think about that. You'll never see it anyway. So, whatever. And if you come to grief, you have the choice then. Oh, the best lawyers, your time in prison will be surprisingly comfortable if that's what you want. But I'm hoping you'd say, David, get me the hell out of here and I'll come in and get you out and I'll really enjoy that. So as I said at the start of this episode, David McMillan is not a man you would look at and think, well, there's a hardened criminal. I mean, of course, he's now 67 years old and a very slightly built man. But even in his more, shall we say, sprightly years, 
he had more of a look of a man that you might meet at the bank about a home loan, not someone you'd go to to get your hands on 10 kilos of Columbia's finest. David said this had an obvious advantage when it came to the authorities. However, he was also dealing with some very dangerous people. So how did he avoid getting himself into trouble with them? Again, Jack, there is a technique that even the most featherweight of people can protect themselves Mm. because I always found that people fear what they don't know. You know, you'd meet somebody for business and say, uh, look, um, Naro, the people now, I mean, they really depend on me for a living and they come from a a bit village. If something goes wrong, they'll kind of, they won't really ask anything much. They just have a handful of photos and start tearing up when they see any of them and shoot them all. So uh, let, let's try and not you know, rock the boat on this one. You know? So the idea of kidnapping me and wringing money out of me was not... Somebody would be really very reckless mm. to um, take that on because they just didn't know where this unseen enemy might come from. And, of course, anybody who's really capable of doing anything, you certainly don't want to look the part. Certainly, um, the more, uh, when I say respected, more professional of um, killers I've met was certainly never look the part. I didn't know you were too young, but there was a guy called Jim Baisley, he was Australian. Jim, you would never expect to look, they'd look like a kind of grandfatherly type. Yeah. In fact, part of the case against him when it came up was that he refused to shoot the family dog. So a very brief Australian criminal history lesson for you. The man that David is referring to is James Frederick Baisley, also known as the Iceman or Machine Gun. And he's long believed to be the hitman who gunned down prominent anti-drug campaigner and Liberal politician Don McKay. It's an order supposedly given by the Italian Mafia in Australia in the 1970s and was the subject of Channel 9's underbelly series A Tale of Two Cities. James Baisley died at the age of 90 in 2018, a free man in a Melbourne nursing home, although no stranger to the inside of a prison cell. In fact, in 1986, he was sentenced to nine years behind bars for the conspiracy to murder Mr McKay. But was never tried over being the one who actually fired the gun used to kill the politician. He also was handed a life sentence for his role in the double murder of drug couriers Isabel and Douglas Wilson, whose bodies were recovered in 1979. However handed a life sentence, Mr Baisley would walk out of prison in 2001. Mr McKay's remains were never found. Mr Baisley kept his secret until the very end. Police would describe this man as someone who saw murder as a job and felt absolutely no remorse. So you weren't really, you were hanging around some very, very dangerous people then? A few, yeah, a few were different. But but the, the genuinely strong ones were not bullies. And it's certainly amongst this tiny core because there weren't many good ones there there was a lot of loyalty when i was in i was locked up in in thailand and it was a disaster there nobody really knew what had happened to me or clearly anyway um they knew sort of where i was but after months and months and months i finally found myself inside the prison behind the rice stacks of a little warehouse where they kept food uh, by the chinese thais who who gave me a rather bulky looking mobile phone and I got through to Michael at some ungodly hour and he hadn't heard from me a long time. He interrupted me as I began to explain the extraordinary event. He said, David, don't explain anything. We don't have time. Just tell me what I've got to do and what I need to bring. I thought, well, you know, that's what you want, don't you? Yeah, that's what you want on your side. Absolutely, totally. (laughs) This Michael that David speaks of was his longtime business partner and former champion pole vaulter, Michael Sullivan. A man whose life likely would have been vastly different if he had been able to represent Australia in the Olympic Games. 
Michael was, in fact, the first ever Australian to break the 16-foot mark in pole vaulting, but was passed over by Olympic selectors in 1968 for the Mexico City squad. He would later suffer a severe ankle break, which would not only see him miss the Commonwealth Games, but also lead him to develop an addiction to his pain medication, which then led to drugs and his eventual meeting with David. And so a long and lucrative partnership began. By this stage, David had cut ties with the retired safecrackers and he, Michael, and their Thai connection, Mr Chowdhury, were building a very lucrative business. As David's wealth grew, so did his appetite for the finer things in life. And it would apparently be the purchase of an incredibly expensive American roadster that would eventually bring the attention of Australian police. They would soon discover that this David McMillan had properties all over the world. Melbourne, Bangkok, London, Hong Kong and Brussels. And had had more than 11 overseas trips in one year. However, there was seemingly no explanation for this man's extreme wealth. The police continued to do more digging on this man of mystery, only to discover a list of 43 couriers across Melbourne, Sydney and London that David was using. Also, no less than 38 birth certificates and 27 passports under false names. The police now well and truly had David and his syndicate in their sights and Operation Ares was closing in. It would in fact be David's travel agent that would tip him off about police making inquiries into him. Two detectives came in with a long list of names they wanted travel details for. On that list was 30 names, 26 of which were aliases used by David at the time. What made David such a success was his love of risk and adventure. However, this would also be his downfall as Operation Ares swoops. In Australia, I was arrested after a very long task force, state, federal operation. Um, I was warned, sure, I'd get out of town, I didn't. Arrogance again. I thought, well, if they're a, a big police setup, then they won't cheat too much because they'll want to get the goods. I mean, but they moved in and arrested when there was no, and no drugs to be found, and it makes for a very tough case. Mm. Now, Jack, if you ever find yourself on a murder charge, hope that they found a body because you can, you've got something to win over if mm. it's a conspiracy where it's all innuendo and talk and so much evidence can go in that's just chatter. We thought uh, there, there were 12 couriers. They didn't say a word. They were good. The code of silence was being upheld so far by all involved. However, police would tighten the screws on the team by arresting both David and Michael's significant others and placing them in prison when tragedy would strike. Because the evidence wasn't very strong, they did a mass arrest thing, the families got rounded up. My Italian wife at the time, uh, Clelia Vigano, was arrested. Michael's Colombian wife was uh, arrested. she just had a baby. Um, still nothing. Nobody was wakening. Um, the, they put an informer in the Fairly Women's Prison to extract some kind of information out of them. But their choice of informer, um, Danielle, was a poor choice indeed. She was an arsonist, and that was his solution to anything, to set fire to the place, which she did, and burnt the women's prison, that section of it anyway, to the ground. That caused the death of Clelia and Michael's wife, Mary. And something you don't want to hear any time, but it's particularly creepy, uh, when you're in a prison. And, and the prisons in those days didn't barely had radios, so 11 o'clock at night they'd switch it off and I just heard the beginning of the story about a fire at the women's prison. Sir, so, this evening about quarter past eight, uh, 20 past eight, an alarm was received from the remand section at Fairley 
the fire brigade attended with uh, quite a number of appliances and on attending uh, they found a uh, fire burning in the remand section. Some fatalities, click, and it was off. As a result of that fire, uh, three female prisoners are deceased. So after a restful night's sleep, mm. <laughs> I came out of the cell in the morning and straight over to one of the officers I knew. Well, and I skipped the formalities. Oh, Dave, uh, shuffling around, pushing pens around his desk. Um, we uh, look um, not clear at the moment, but look, uh, I know you're probably you know, a bit worried or that. That wasn't a good sign, and nobody would talk to us. And Michael and I were called up for a legal visit a few hours later. Um, deserted visit center. One officer on duty who was busy examining his foot or something. Yeah, 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 through the next door. And all our families were there, well, those who remained anyway. So that was, uh, of course, I felt completely responsible and, and guilty. Uh, I, I felt like really for the first time I had blood on my hands and it was almost like my own. Still, the authorities, to make the best of a bad situation, put it about that um, we had uh, started to uh, eliminate all the witnesses and... Starting with your own wives. Country. Yeah. David and Michael have been held in Jaika Jaika, the high security section of the infamous Pentridge Prison home to prisoners like Chopper Reed and Ned Kelly. It was designed as a prison within a prison to hold Victoria's toughest and longest-serving prisoners. Jika Jika had six separate units, all with nothing but concrete, electric doors and remote locking. The furnishings were sparse and prisoners would exercise in small, escape-proof yards. Eventually, Jika Jika would be closed down after a number of inmates would die in a fire that had been deliberately lit. However, David and Michael were eventually taken out of Jaika Jaika, but a supposed planned escape would see them taken straight back again. The trial was made worse by a lot of stirrings, including the great prison helicopter escape that wasn't. It, it, was, it was set up by um, Lord Tony Moyn, Moynihan, who was a, a, a fraudster, from the UK, settled in the Philippines. I'd sort of done some business with him. I knew I couldn't trust him. When he said he'd sending a former SAS commando to uh, arrange a helicopter escape, I knew it was likely to be just a scam. But I didn't realize that it was actually uh, a scam done with the cooperation of the federal police. <laughs> this, this Idiot came over and said, listen, you can get some money out of them. Just pretend you're ex-SAS and go through it. Get a quarter of a million, send me my bid, all of that. I suppose Lord Tony thought he'd get something out of that before the axe fell, but he got double-crossed along with everybody else. So really, at the, the beginning of the trial, there was that helicopter escape, so it was back into the Supermax prison again. And So the, the, the and authorities then, got wind that this was supposedly happening and, and then... Well, they should know because it was their... <laughs> it was their idea. <laughs> the, yeah, the, from the day the guy arrived, the Hilton Hotel in Collingwood, was uh, his room was monitored. They put him into a special one. Uh, uh, my friend and accountant, Max, uh, got dragged into it and went to see him a couple of times. And I said, look, keep away from the guy. God knows what's behind this. You just don't want to be seen there. But it, it was coincided with the first week of the drug conspiracy trial. And that's all we've got time for. But coming up in our next episode, while David is in prison, the police waste no time in enjoying what he's left behind. Uh, the police moved into my house in Bone Morris. They partied like it was 1999 and the local police had to come down to stop the noise. And once released finally from Australian prison, he decides to leave the country. On his way to England, he'd make a stop-off. A stop-off that was going to cost him his life. And this was during a, a visit into uh, the prison in Thailand by some Australian liaison officer. And said, oh, by the way, uh, you know your fact, don't you? You're, you're finished. Next time on Wanted. 
I'm a wanderer of the soul Before the end I plan to be whole But I know I'll lose myself along the way What's gone is gone What's past is past 